What had he done to make her hate him so much? In the space of a couple of hours, she had gone from what seemed like the perfect woman to a spiteful, foul-mouthed nut. Carrie Farber's nowhere to be found. Her family is bewildered, and the police are suspecting she might be having some sort of breakdown. As for Dave Krupa, in the days since receiving her first bizarre text messages, he receives a barrage of angry messages. She started texting him a bunch of profanities, calling him names, telling him she hated him. They were bad, and they were just all about how bad of a person I am. Carrie was acting like a woman scorned. Her messages were filled with jealousy and rage. Carrie's rage seems to be focused on his on-again, off-again ex-girlfriend, Liz, who he had dated before Carrie. Which is confusing to Dave, because uh, Carrie seemed to be so unaffected by her first interaction with Liz. And Carrie is contacting Liz directly, too. Liz gets into contact with me and says that now Carrie is harassing her via text uh, and email. She was very upset. She wanted to know how this woman that she just had this chance encounter with at Dave's apartment got her phone number, got her email. One day, Liz arrived home from work to find that her garage had been vandalized. Upon pulling into the garage, she found that someone had written pour from Dave on the inside of her garage in spray paint. Liz calls the police and files a report. When Liz tells police that the common link between herself and Carrie is Dave Krupa, they decide to pay him a visit. The police show up at my work looking for me and they didn't look very friendly. I was the last known person, or at least the assumed last person to see her. As soon as they're looking at me with those policeman eyes, uh, that got me pretty rattled. Uh, you know, I pulled out my phone and said, no, she's lost her mind. She's going crazy. She's harassing me. Their tone certainly changed from an accusatory one to, oh, okay, we've seen this before. Meanwhile, back in Iowa, Carrie's mom doesn't know about any of this. All she knows is that her daughter's missing. Carrie's mother had filed the missing person report with the police, and she was becoming increasingly concerned with each passing day. In the weeks after she left, Carrie was still communicating with her family. She would send text messages to her mother, Nancy. When I'd get text messages, I would just say, please call me. I just need to hear your voice. And she would say, uh, well, this has got to be good enough for you. And Maxwell started getting texts saying, we're going to be moving you down to Kansas. You're going to go to school down there. And he was really scared. It was just shocking to me. Nancy is so concerned that she takes over guardianship of Max in Carrie's absence. In addition to her brother's wedding, Carrie was missing more family events. She was absent for her own birthday. She missed Thanksgiving. She wasn't around when her son Max turned 15. She even missed her own father's funeral. And when she didn't come home for that, her mother knew that something was very, very wrong. Carrie texted, I'm sorry I missed the funeral. Nancy responded, the only way I will know that this is you is if you call me and I hear your voice. The weather had changed and was starting to get colder. We went into her house and I noticed her winter coat was sitting on the chair. And I thought, she doesn't have any warm clothes with her. What, what is she gonna do? How is she getting along? Where, how, where is she eating? What is she doing? It was terrifying. It was scary not knowing where she is. Okay, maybe she had gone off her meds. There had been times in the past when she had thought, maybe I don't need these. The text got mean at one point, too, and saying that I wasn't a good mother and that I was controlling. In the middle of that bleak winter, only one thing was certain. People were afraid. While Carrie's family was afraid for her, Dave Krupa was growing afraid of her. 
I would regularly receive 60 plus texts a day, 100 emails a day, it was not uncommon. And as far as phone calls, hundreds of hundreds. And I'd changed phone numbers so many times, it was ridiculous. Carrie would refer to Liz in her messages. She is nothing. She's a fat cow. She looks like she lost her puppy. Maybe she'll do us all a favor and kill herself, LOL. She wrote to Liz, if you don't keep your hands and lips off my man, I will hurt you. And she seems to be everywhere. On one specific occasion, I was uh, sitting in my lazy boy with my feet up, watching TV, trying to relax, and it's nighttime. And I get a text saying, I see you, you're sitting in your chair with your feet propped up, wearing a blue shirt, and those things were true. She was no longer just ranting at a boyfriend that things didn't go well with. She was flat out stalking him. Carrie writes, my favorite thing to do is stand outside your window and stare at you. Then finally, there's a clue. One night in January, about two months after all of this started, Dave came home from work and there was a vehicle in the parking lot. He got closer to the vehicle uh, and he recognized it to be Carrie's Ford Explorer because he knew it very well. That was how they met. He had worked on the vehicle. So I took a picture of the license plate, sent it to the police. He had no idea at the time how big of a piece of evidence this would turn out to be. It had one perfect fingerprint on it. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.